Tonight I'm interviewing Sharon Osborne, which is a bit like putting yourself voluntarily into Hannibal Lecter's cage. If Pin starts with me, he's going to get it. He knows better now than to start with me. She's done it all. Whether it's fighting cancer, nearly losing her husband to a quad bike tragedy. Piers don't want to know all the shit, all the dirt. Come on! Being a huge rock manager, then becoming a huge TV star herself. It doesn't worry me, you know, the good, the bad, the ugly, I'll talk about it. But most of all, I want to know, what does she think about Danny Minogue? He doesn't want to know about my donations to charity. Anything can happen with this woman. You never know what you're going to get. I'm quite fearful tonight, to be honest. I've waited so long for this moment. <laughs> You're right. When people ask you what you do, what, what do you say? I'm a businesswoman because um, I always laugh when I, I read reviews and it goes, well, she's got no talent. And I'm like, you got it. I don't. That's why I went initially behind and, and went into the business side instead of, like, on the stage. I don't have any talent. It's just me. What you have that I think people love and are slightly fearful of is volatility. I mean, you are a, you're a dangerous creature, Sharon. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know about <laughs> that, but I, 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 I think that the one thing that I, I like to have is my um, opinion, which I think I've earned at my age, and my honesty. And that's why when people um, say things about me which aren't true, it pisses me off because the one thing I have is just my my truthfulness. That's it, you know? You go quite a long way to defend yourself, don't you? Um, if I have to, yeah, I will. I You've will. done some fairly extraordinary things to people when they cross you, haven't you? Like what? Well, for instance, I mean, you have been known to send gifts in Tiffany boxes. I... Firstly, <laughs> let me add, I haven't sent a Tiffany box for years. Right. But I did used to send Tiffany boxes full of crap to people who annoyed me. Your own crap? No, it was always the kids. All oh, right. And I would always get, <laughs> I would get the kids to crap in a box. And I, I can remember Jack saying, Mummy, why do I have to poo in a box? And I'm like, <laughs> Jack, shut up and keep shitting. <laughs> 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 how often did you send this little Jack treasure to people? It depends how often people really annoyed me. <laughs> Is it true you did it to Elton John once? Because he nicked one of your boyfriends? No, um, never. I never, ever, ever did anything like that to Elton. I, I adore him. And actually, I nicked one of his. Ah, did you? <laughs> yeah, but I was so pissed I didn't know. I was so drunk, and then the next morning, I woke up and I saw who was on the pillow next to me, and I'm like, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. <laughs> it's like, get out of town while you still can. Talking of bats, you've recently had an absolutely humongous one on American television with a young woman called... Uh, oh, don't Megan, Megan Hauserman. She said that you were only famous for managing a brain-dead rock star, at which point you did that. Oh, no, I... Walked over and doused a uh, young houseman in water. Yeah. <laughs> You've lost none of your fire, have you, Sarah? No. No, she's, um... <laughs> hey, you know, again, say what you want about me. She's never met my husband. She doesn't know anything about his career, what he's achieved. Uh, nothing. It's clear that you're someone who shouldn't be messed with under any circumstances, and that seems to have served you pretty well, actually. Sharon Osborne's life has been nothing less than dramatic. Some of the things she's gone through, she's got a nutter husband for a start. 
And I think it's great because the pair of them are mad. I forget, you know, where she's come from. She started backstage as a ruthless music manager. Throughout the management industry, there wasn't a woman who was that tough. She did have a wicked temper. She headbutted this guy in the nose. She then became an international celebrity in her own right. When she decided she wanted to be on that other side of the camera, yeah, it's it was gonna happen. It turned out really to be wonderful for her and her whole family and all of us in the world because, uh, you know, she's such a fantastic woman. Sharon famously lit up our screens in The X Factor. She's found out what she really wants to do and she's really passionate about this work she does on TV. She loves it. But her time on the show wasn't exactly without drama. <laughs> and Sharon didn't always see eye to eye with her fellow judges. I don't think there was much of a relationship. You definitely wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of Sharon. So after four successful years, she left the show in a shroud of mystery. I know that there was a period of time where the show became less fun for Sharon. Let's clear it up once and for all, because I'm sure everyone here, like me, wants to know. What, what's the truth about why you left X Factor? Um... I left X Factor because of Danny Minogue. Simple as that? Yeah, simple as that. Why? Um, I, I didn't enjoy working with her at all. And the prospect of spending six months sat next to her, I just thought, my life's better than that. I'm, I'm not going to do it. You said recently that she has her tongue firmly up Simon Cowell's backside, <laughs> that yeah, her tears are fake, and her plastic surgery is terrible. <laughs> oh, it is bad. <laughs> when you first met Danny... Yeah? ..was it instantaneous hatred? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And when everybody said that she was coming into the show, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, that's great, you know. Uh, she's fantastic, you know. That would be great. And it You didn't just... see her as a, as a younger threat? Come on, Piers. I was 54 at the time she was coming. 54. Been round the block too many <laughs> times. <laughs> 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 I mean, come on. You, yeah, know, you only how look can 25, be... that's the thing, Sharon. It's I like, wish. You know. um, but it's, it's like a threat. I mean, it's, I've not led my life like that or my career like that, where I'm, you know, built on my looks or my youth or, you know, it's... I'm not in that... That's not a competitive thing for me. If it was someone who was a top manager, and they had, like, five or six huge acts, I'd be like, ooh, shit, watch that one. But th if there was no competition because I'm not in her, you know, we we're so opposite. But to start with, it was OK, then, from what you're saying? Um, the first day, it was fabulous. <laughs> till about 12 in the morning... Well, 12 noon, and then it went downhill. And what, what happened? What went wrong? I just didn't like her. Why didn't you like her? Where do you want to begin? No sense of humour. I've got all night. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd better take my coat off then. Um, no sense of humour. Um, was the new girl in town. And she would literally do this. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sweet little puppy. I'm like, what the f*** is going on? <laughs> We're, like, trying to do a show and she's pretending to be literally like this. I'm a little doggy. Did you think that Danny was qualified to be a judge? She wasn't qualified to judge, but I thought she was a good choice for the show because she's young, she's pretty, and you it makes for a good combination with the judges when you've got somebody there that's, you know, the little pretty thing. And I thought that she would, you know, be giggly and funny and sweet, and it would add to the show. But um, it didn't turn out that way. And when it went wrong between you, Mm -hmm. How frosty did it get? I mean, did you talk to her at all? Did you have any relationship? Oh, it was terrible. My God, it was terrible. Um, the first day that we went live in the studio, I asked to see her. 
and um, she couldn't see me. And about 20 minutes before we were due to go on live the first night, I went storming in the dressing room. There I was, all puffed up, you know, let me get to her. <laughs> <laughs> and I go in there and I'm like, right. All of this that you've been saying about me in the press, I'm jealous of you because you're younger, you're prettier. I'm like, why? Why are you saying this? And she's like, well, I'm not saying this. <laughs> no. Oh, no. And it's like, cut the crap. Why are you saying it? Just stop. You know, there's no point. Just stop. And I, I think it's really... It really made me crazy because instead of being confrontational and saying, well, actually, it's what I think, or it's good for the show, the press love it, or whatever, you know, to deny it makes... Don't insult me. I've been around way too long. I know how the press work. I know the way it all works. Don't insult me by saying you didn't say it. At least own it. So the atmosphere... I mean, people always imagine these stories are drummed up for the media and stuff. But what you're saying is it was a very real conflict between you. You really hated each other. See, I didn't hate her because hatred is very close to love. It takes a lot of emotion and I don't have that time for her. I just... She'd just dismiss her. She's like an insect. She was like a, an insect, a mosquito. You know when you're on holiday and you keep bloody itching <laughs> it and you're going, won't it go away, you know? And it was like this and it was like week after week she's still there. <laughs> you know, and it's like, dog. God, is she still here? So when the series ended, you'd done it four years. I mean, you loved that show, didn't you? Loved, loved... I mean, come on, it's the most fantastic show to watch on TV and it's even more fantastic to be a part of it. I absolutely adored the show. Do you miss it? Hugely. Of course you do. I, I mean, after four years, I still felt a big, big part of me was in that show. I just adored the show. My gut was telling me that this is something is going to happen. I just instinctively knew. Did you think you were going to die? Absolutely. His eyes were open, but it wasn't my husband talking to me. You know, he was totally gone. <laughs> the one relationship in your life I think has probably had more effect on you than any other was with your father, Don Arden, who was a notorious rock manager. From all I've heard about him, I've got to be honest and say that he comes over in quite a monstrous, nasty way a lot of the time. Is that a fair assessment of him? Overall, I think he was a very... Um, ..mean man, he was. But if he loved you, he, he really did love you. But it still didn't stop him from using you for whatever he wanted you to do. What did he make you do? Lie, cheat, you know. I mean, he was... Let's explain. Your, your father, Don Arden, was not just any old rock manager. He was, for a long time, the most feared, infamous rock manager in the world, probably. He had a reputation for being very violent. Yeah, he, he could be. He could be violent, yeah. Carry gun? Um, from time to time, yeah. I mean, for a young woman growing up, this must have been a scary environment. I thought that everybody was like that. I didn't know any different. I didn't think there was anything wrong with it till I was about 15, 14, 15. It kind of like, oh, your dad doesn't have a gun, <laughs> why not? <laughs> you know, your dad doesn't have heavies that live with you, like, why, why not? It, it, it wasn't until I was, you know, 14, 15 that it really, you know, sunk in that people don't have to live this way. Did you see him be violent to people? Um, yeah, but not badly violent, you know. I'd see him um, beat a few people up, you know, nothing major. <laughs> <laughs> How much do you think of Don's behaviour rubbed off on you? A lot. A lot. But the one thing that I did get from him... I mean, I got a lot from him, I can't say the one thing, but the one thing was, I suppose, survival.
But, you know, also I got an amazing um, education from my father in life. I mean, I, I went to the best university in the world. The Don Arden University? Yeah. I mean, I think about the things that I saw, the people who I mixed with when I was a child. I mean, amazing things. I had the most amazing musical and education as a child because of my father. At the age of 15, you went to work for him mm -hmm. in his music management business. What were you thinking at the time about your own career? Were you thinking, I want to be like my dad, I want to get into this business? Or were you just there having a bit of fun? Oh, no, I was, I was there um, seriously, this is it. You know, I'm going to be a businesswoman, I'm going to be a manager, I'm going to take over this business when my father retires, and this is what I'm going to do. Absolutely. You were 17 when you meet a band called Black Sabbath, and there's a lead singer, Ozzy Osbourne. What was your first impression? Of Aussie. Fear. <laughs> I mean, he was an outrageous physical specimen at the time, wasn't he? Oh, he was. He was. He was, you know, hair everywhere and just odd clothes and he spoke an odd way and just everything about him I thought then was odd. Wasn't he wearing a tap round his neck? Yeah, he? on a piece of string. <laughs> yeah. Didn't that send you warning bell, Sharon? But... This is that not was, your normal guy. That was his jewellery because it was the colour gold, the tap was gold, so he thought it was his jewellery, so that's what he wore. Did you fancy him? Then, no. Um, when, he, when I first saw him, no. But I didn't really get a good look at his face because I was like, oh, hell, and I was behind a big switchboard, so I kept my head down, you know, and, like, just peeked over the top of it. So, Sharon, you were, like your dad had been, you were young, ferociously ambitious and you had a yearning to run a big rock band. In 1976, Sharon left the UK to manage her father Don's music business from LA and soon carved out a reputation as a tough, uncompromising manager. She could be really soft and cute, and then something goes the other way, and she'll f*** you. She had a disagreement with somebody's manager, and there was, it was like a catering room, so she'd just grab the fork off the... I guess the deli platter and forked him. Shortly afterwards, Black Sabbath booted out their troublesome singer, Ozzy Osbourne. I used to be out of control all the time, every day. Every single day. Ozzy was in a state, but Sharon went to him with a proposal. She said, listen, if you get your shit together, we want to manage you. And I'm like, what? She'd taken a massive gamble, but began to get Ozzy's career back on track. Believe me, if it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't be sitting here now. I wouldn't be alive. Sharon definitely kept him alive and made a huge star out of him. Sharon and Ozzy became an item, but her already volatile relationship with her father was beginning to fall apart. Sharon's love affair grew with the Oz, and she want, wanted to look after him, and obviously that was not going down very well with her father. And it was to get worse. We were going to go to lunch at the Beverly Hills Hotel, Sharon, Ozzy, me. So we get down there. Over in the corner is the old man's girlfriend. She went over there, tipped the whole table up. They're all covered in Russian salad. Drinks are gone over their heads. It was just carnage. Things have become so bad, Sharon stopped talking to her father for the next 20 years. I wasn't made aware that he was, in fact, alive until I was, I think, close to 16. Um, I was always told that he had passed away. I felt sorry for him, losing so much time. Her success was great. Three fantastic children, and he wasn't a part of that. And it just is quite sad. What finally happened to precipitate you and your dad going separate ways? My father and I, our relationship was really bad from about 79. And Ozzy and I got together in 80 and we got married in 82. And when we got married, I basically said, we want out, we want to go. And I seriously, I know I was naive, I seriously thought that when we were married, my father would let Ozzy out of his contracts and let us go. And, um, of course, he wouldn't. <laughs> You know. How did he react? Oh, it was like, 
you know, Aussies under contract to me and, and that's it. And he'll stay with me. And Aussies contract was, you know, totally one-sided, was an awful contract. And if, if my father, you know, posted a letter for Aussie, he would charge you for that stamp. There was just no way we could have, you know, we could have survived it. We had to get out. And you didn't see him again for 20 years? 20 years. How did you come to make up with him? Um, my brother like, called me and told me that my father was basically alone, sick, and near as damn it broke. Why should you care? He was my father and I was doing extremely well. And he was sick and on his own. So what did you do? I met him and from that day took care of him till the day he died. Let's go back to cheerier times when you and Ozzy get together. You've fallen for this crazy rock star and you are both leading a pretty crazy life, weren't you? Oh, it was just insane when I think about it. I mean, I can remember going to pubs with Ozzy and I, I had my nighty on with a fur coat over it. <laughs> because he would, we'd wake up and he'd go, let's go to the pub. And I'm like, I'm not dressed. He'd go, put a coat on. And I'd literally have a nighty with a fur coat over me. I mean, just insane behaviour. And you were just totally in love mostly drunk, the pair of you, having a great time. Oh, God, the best time, the best, best, you know, when you love someone so much that when you see them, you get, like, the butterflies and, you know, just the look of them, the smell of them. There wasn't one thing that I didn't adore about him. Do you remember the moment you actually fell in love with him? Mm-hmm. Yep. It wasn't Absolutely. the night in the fur coat night, was it? <laughs> no, it was, it was the first night that we ever, ever got together, like, sexually. He said I raped him, but I didn't. <laughs> um, and it was that first night, and it was like, oh, my God, this is what it's meant to be like. This is the way it's meant to feel when you love someone and you make love, and this is what it's like. It was the first time in my life that I'd made love with anyone. <laughs> Because before it was just, you know, lie here and think of the Queen and, you know, hope it's going to be over in a minute. Um, and we could get the telly back on. But um, it was the first, you know, the first time I'd made love with anyone. It was just amazing. Just the most amazing, amazing thing. When you were both in love, young, partying, having a great time, did any, anything happen where you thought, this could be bad? this relationship for both of us? Oh, God, Piers, it was so volatile. Our relationship was so terribly volatile. It was like we had the best lovemaking, the best friendship, and the worst fights you could ever, ever imagine. I mean, it was just everything was overly passionate. And as much as we, we loved each other, we fought terribly, terribly. And it was, you know, I was drinking with him and I'd wake up and I'd have black eyes and I'd have chunks cut out of my hair and I'm like, what the hell happened? And he'd be like, I don't know. And I'd be like, well, I don't know. Because, you know, you drink so much that you just go into blackouts. I would drink whatever Ozzy ordered me and I would, you know, try and keep up with him. Ozzy had a unique way of selling himself to record companies, didn't he? In those days, you know, the record company was everything. It's not like it is today, you know. Oh, my God. Whatever the record company said, one did. And um, the American CBS, they, you know, they signed Ozzy, but it wasn't really... They weren't exactly over the moon about signing him. I think that it was more a favour to my father that they signed him. And we went to meet all the staff, and so... We said, all right, what can we do to win them over? Oh, somebody came up with, well, let's take doves of peace. Just Wrong. to let them free in the let room. Let them free. So Ozzy all had... All quite innocent. All this. innocent. So we had these four white doves and they were in two in pockets here and then in Ozzy's inside pockets. 
And so we, we go in, they play Ozzy's music, and he sits on this girl's knee, and he gets the birds and goes like that, and they're all like, oh, you know, and the birds are <laughs> flying around, and then suddenly one lands on Ozzy's knee. And for some reason, he just picked it up, and put it in his mouth, and yanked the head off and spat it out on the table. <laughs> they literally called security, and we were thrown out. <laughs> but we were thrown out, and I was laughing so much that as we're being thrown out of the office, I'm peeing myself. So there's a big <laughs> trail of me holding myself like this, peeing out of the office. And we're like, oh, I think we've been dropped from the record company now. Your reputation as a rock and roll maverick was now established, but your, your main act, Ozzy Osbourne, was increasingly out of control. Ozzy was constantly on tour and his career was flourishing, but his boozy relationship with Sharon was often violent. We'd fight, we'd punch the shit out of each other. I mean, not a row fight, I mean, a fist fight, throwing crap at each other. She's not like a little flower. She'd be giving definitely as good as she gets. Eventually, Sharon stopped drinking and took control of their lives. She said, I'm going to quit. One of us has got to remain sober, which will never get anywhere. I said, she's probably got a hangover, she'll be all right in a few days, come back to me, and she never did again. In 1982, Sharon and Ozzy got married, and the tour bus often resembled a crash for their three young children, Amy, Kelly and Jack. And so they're all growing up, she's carting all of them about on a tour bus, she's trying to manage him, who's all over the place. Sharon definitely had her hands full trying to organise and maintain a tour keep Ozzy clean and sober, and having children all at the same time. But despite Sharon's best efforts, Ozzy was drinking more than ever. She would become very upset by that, but also, in a way, sort of accepting, because she knew that that's how he was. One night, he wanted to go for a drink. She's locked him up and taken his clothes. He put one of her dresses on to go out and have a drink. He was absolutely mental. There were a few times where it was definitely not funny anymore. Ozzy's antics came to her head when, in the midst of a drug and drink bender, he tried to strangle Sharon. She called me absolutely, obviously, absolutely devastated. I was just out of control. I was drinking bottles of booze every day, doing drugs and everything. I think that that was a big wake up call for both of them, for both of them, not just Ozzy. What do you remember of that evening? It was just one of those weeks that was particularly bad for Ozzy. He was just... He had so many different prescribed drugs that he had. And I remember we had one of those um, mortar things where you crush... It's meant to crush spices and things. And he would put all his medication in and just crush it up and just take it all. I mean, all stuff that he wasn't meant to be taking and drinking and drinking and, and that week we'd probably had about four fights, fist fights together. So these are proper, like, whacking each other? Oh, yeah, 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 big, big fist fights that we'd had. And, you know, it, your gut, my gut was telling me that this is something is going to happen. I just instinctively knew. And it was just, you know, kids were in bed, I was sat downstairs, and he comes in, and then it's all off. As soon as he came around the door, I'm like, oh, hell, what's going to happen now? You know, the, the eyes that I knew were just gone, you know. They were open, his eyes were open, but it wasn't my husband talking to me. You know, he was totally gone. And what happened? He just said he made a decision. He said, weave, and everything was, we've made a decision, and we've been talking about it, and we've decided you've got to die. I'm like, oh, hell. Weave, all right, OK. And he was very calm. Presumably you hadn't reached this decision. <laughs> no, no, I was totally <laughs> unaware of this decision, and I'm sat there going, oh, how do I get out of here? And then just suddenly he just dove on me, and that was it. I'm like... Did you think you were going to die? Yeah, absolutely. And all I could keep thinking of was the children, the children, the children. I can't let this happen. This isn't going to happen to me. 
Yeah, those kids, they're upstairs asleep and I'm going to be doing their breakfast in a minute and he ain't going to do this to me. And I was feeling on the coffee table and we have a panic button and I pressed the panic button and the alarm went off and we had this really huge alarm on top of our house and he didn't hear anything. He just carried on and I blacked out. And then when I came to, he was sat on the floor looking at me. Just numb, never said a word, nothing. And then within, I think it was under three minutes, the police were there. And they arrested him? They totally arrested him and took him away. ozzy has been taken to the police station. You're just coming round from being unconscious, having been strangled nearly to death. Did they, you think it was over between you? Oh, then? I didn't. I didn't think about that. I didn't think about the future. I just was like, just alone. I had nobody to call. But are you thinking you're ever going to see Ozzy again? Or are you thinking, I, I can't do this anymore? You go through that, oh, that's it. It's over, it's over, you know. And you... And I must, you know, I've got to be totally truthful. For the first two or three weeks, I was, like, totally relieved. I, I knew that when I came home, there wasn't going to be any arguments. I knew that the kids were going to be safe, that there wasn't going to be any atmosphere. Because, you know, kids pick up on atmosphere. You don't have to say a word. They know something's wrong. And for the kids to come home and the house to be peaceful and... I didn't have to keep looking at my watch thinking, oh, God, the pubs are open, he's going to be, you know, off or he's coming back now, the pubs are closed. I had none of that. And I went through two, three weeks of, like, ah, this is heaven. And then I missed my husband. The kids and I would, would go out somewhere and we'd look at a newsstand and all these front covers and it's us, and we would literally piss ourselves laughing. When you said you were taking him back, how did Ozzy react? Oh, I didn't tell him. I made him suffer. <laughs> I made him suffer. He, he went through six months of, you know, treatment and not knowing whether he was coming back or not. But you got him off the booze, you got him home, and you got back to family life as it should be, without all the violence. Yeah. But you were about to make a big decision that would change all of your lives. In 2001, Sharon decided to allow MTV cameras into her family's Beverly Hills home. Probably Sharon figured, you know what, we can make this happen. Other people might have had reservations, but I bet she didn't. The Osbournes was a bizarre fly-on-the-wall snapshot of their day-to-day -day lives. When you shut the f*** up, Well, so much of the world couldn't imagine somebody's child talking about their vagina to their dad or knowingly have their dog shit on the carpet. I, I live in a $9 million turd. Those things just were quite entertaining to everybody. Nobody knew how successful the show would be, but ratings soared. Had no idea what was going to happen. I think it was a shock to everybody. Certainly a shocked MTV. The show was like a shooting star, you know. It's like, uh, here we are. We, we, haven't, we haven't had acting lessons. We don't know nothing about TV. It was a good education in a lot of ways. The Osbournes was fast becoming MTV's biggest ever show. But during a routine medical checkup, Sharon was diagnosed with cancer. I think she was trying to get Ozzy to get a colonoscopy, so she had to show him that it wasn't a big problem, so she volunteered to do it, and lo and behold, they found a cancerous polyp. Everybody was completely devastated because we did know quite quickly how serious it was. I remember thinking, you know what? She can't survive this. I was very upset because I didn't know if I was going to see her again. Despite her illness, Sharon decided to carry on filming while she received treatment. Chemo knocks the crap out of you. 
She says, it's reality TV. You can't get much real, real than this. Had I had more control, I would have thrown those cameras in the ocean, so. I remember saying to her, Sharon, what the f are you doing? I said, you know, you never think you were living your last day on Earth. She said, after what I've been through, I'm probably am. Ah, oh, it's bringing all, you know, all back again. You know, that whole journey. It's like, ooh, dear. <laughs> the moment you were told you had cancer, did you think that's it? Did you think, I'm going to beat this? What was the Sharon Osbourne reaction? Fear. Absolute fear. Um, I was in New York and I was with the kids, all three of them, and I, I can just remember I was in the corner of the hallway just curled up with the kids around me. I was just in just absolute fear. Didn't know what to do. How did the kids and Ozzy react? Um, it affected, I think, it affected them much worse than it did me. I mean, literally, Ozzy had a nervous breakdown. Um, Jack went to drugs. Kelly was trying to be the mum, the daughter. You know, it, it, it's, it's one of those things that really is a family disease. Did part of you think that you opened the cameras into the Osborne family, turning the, the public microscope on you all, and then suddenly it seemed, one by one, terrible things began to happen. If you had your time again, just for that reason, would you open the door to MTV? Nobody's ever asked me that question before, Piers. Trust you to be the one. Um, it is always with us that things don't happen small. They're like this, you know? They go off the Richter scale. So my answer would have to be, no, I wouldn't have done it. What were the funniest moments for you, do you think? If you could relive some of those moments now, what, which ones would you choose? The funniest thing for us was the way the show was received because we didn't expect anything. So it wasn't like we'd built ourselves up. You know, we'd built ourselves up for nothing. It was, it was basically an experiment. You know, the kids and I would, would go out somewhere and we'd look at a newsstand and all these front covers and it's us and we would literally piss ourselves laughing. <laughs> You know, and you do nothing. We, we were doing nothing except being ourselves. And we were getting all of this attention. And it was like, oh, this is all right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you like the taste of becoming a star yourself, having worked for so many stars? Oh, God, I love it. I absolutely love it. I'm, I'm probably one of the only... Well, I'm celeb i'm like a b celeb but the only b celeb that actually loves the paparazzi i mean i love them <laughs> i'm so you know, love it when you uh, took part in celebrity x factor rebecca loose and yes. you got into a bit of a, a a spat to put it mildly and she accused you of having no class i think at one stage um, I probably <laughs> don't, do I? I mean, I don't. I mean, I'm just, you know, somebody from Brixton that got lucky. But she, said, right. and I, she said, and I quote, whilst calling you a bully, she said, money can buy you clothes, looks and style, but you have to be born with elegance and class. She's right. You don't think that, do you? I honestly don't know. It's not... I'm not the sort of person that goes, um... I'm a classy lady, you know. Oh, <laughs> I mean, it's not... If that's what she thinks, fine. I think a whole lot worse about that one. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that I didn't like about her was that she had an affair with a married man, but you don't go and sell the story and slag off that person's wife. This might be <laughs> the right time to tell you that she's my second cousin. You are. No, I'm serious. <laughs> Are you joking? <laughs> true. You're joking. It's true. She is. And you're not embarrassed. <laughs> oh, God. Anything you'd like to say to Rebecca at the next christening I go to? <laughs> <laughs> is she really? Honestly. It's seriously true, oh, yeah. God. yeah. I mean, it's fairly distant, don't worry, but it's there. She is a second cousin.
dear. You look amazing now. But it's not been easy, is it? The last thing I think about at night, the first thing in the morning, food. I'm going to move on to another thing that's bobbled around your life that interests me, which is this battle you've had with your, your weight and your image, which you've been very candid about, very honest about. Is it something that still bothers you, or do you think you finally reached a place where I'm sure everyone here looks at you and thinks, I hope I look something like that when I'm Sharon's age? I mean, you look amazing now, but it's not been easy, is it? No, it's terrible. It's, um, to have a weight problem is just a nightmare. The last thing I think about at night, the first thing in the morning, food. Even now? Even now. It never leaves you. It never, ever, ever leaves you. It's a constant battle that you have within your own head. But people looking at you now will find that hard to imagine now that you still think about it as being a problem. Oh, God. It's, you know, the first thing, it's like I'm not one of these people that goes, mmm, God, can't wait for that salad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah. it's just not me. I don't think that way, you know. I'm like, give me the fries, give me the chocolate. You know, I, I love junk food. You've had, by your own admission, a lot of plastic surgery. And by my, from what I'm looking at, it's been very successful, <laughs> if you don't mind me saying. Was it money well spent, do you think? Has it I given know. you self-esteem in a way you wouldn't have had otherwise? Um, it did at the time, but nothing lasts. You know, whatever you have done, you think it's a quick fix, but there is no quick fix. It's like the breasts, you put the implants in, they're fantastic. You know, your boobs are like that, and then you wake up one morning <laughs> and you're going like this again. And, you know... No problem. <laughs> 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 whatever you do is never permanent, you know. It's just a quick, you know, a fix for a while. Are you happy with the way you, you look now? You look in the mirror now and think, yeah, I, I actually like the way I look now. Have you learned to be self-confident like that? No, I'm confident as anything, but I'm not, I don't like the way my ass looks, no. Forgive me for saying this, but you're 56 years old now. You look ludicrously younger than that. Can you reassure the nation that you have no intention of calming down? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> change. I mean, um, I don't know whether I want to change. I'm used to myself. After beating cancer, Sharon threw herself into her TV career. It's just a workaholic mama. She manages me, does these TV shows. She's a mother and she's got like, different things going on all at the same time. In the first time you see her in front of the camera, it's like, do you know what? This girl's got it. It really did happen for her. I think the X Factor really gave her a sense of independence completely away from anything to do with any of us. Following the massive success of the show, she went on to appear with me as a judge on America's Got Talent. This is horrific and I'm going! She's a fighter, you know. And you better watch what you're saying, because she'll come back with a <laughs> flamethrower. Sharon has a new variety show in America with her family, and at 56, shows no sign of slowing down. If someone loves it, what right does anyone, any of us have to say, you know what, well, slow down? I don't doubt that she'll be working probably, you know, till her last day. She's a remarkable person. Whether she's my wife or not, she's unbelievable. I love it more than anything. I'm so happy to be a husband. He's a nice boy, isn't he? Isn't he? Yes. <laughs> when you look back at your life, we've been over so much in this interview where, you know, you've been through great turbulence with Ozzy. You know, violence and drink and drugs and your cancer, the terrible relationship with your father and so on. It's extraordinary that you both ended up so happy and content together, don't you think? I... Yes, the answer is yes. And um, I am just so... Uh, lucky isn't the right word. I, I keep saying I'm blessed because 
I have such an amazing life and I've got such an amazing partner. You know, who knew it was going to end this way? It's just, you know, I wake up every morning and I've got this amazing man next to me who, you know, can't get enough of. What would you like your epitaph to say? Here lies Sharon Osbourne. I tried. You know, I try, I try and learn from my mistakes. I try and be a better person. I try and give back. I try. I try. I'm not successful at it all the time, but I do try. Can I amend that slightly? She was, she was very trying. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, Sharon Osborne. <laughs>